Hi there. This is fun. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be in air conditioning today. It's so hot and sticky outside. It's bad hair weather. <laughs> I guess that's the only negative to me about summer is bad hair weather. <laughs> Any girl with curly hair knows what I'm talking about. Exactly. It's very thematic today. We picked a perfect day to talk about summer and food. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, uh, Katie, for being here. Um, you know, we're we're going to talk about Katie's uh, new book, which, is, as you can see, is called The Endless Summer Cookbook, which is a perfect title for a book that I've been poring over the past week or Thank so, you. as I tend to do with... with um, with cookbooks as a cookbook obsessive, which I know Katie is as well. Um, you know, if you pick this up, I think you'll find that this book is um, where to start. It's, it's charming, it's approachable, it's down to earth, it's entirely unpretentious, it is uh, winning, it is uh, beautiful, it's just delectable, it's Thank actually you. all the things that, you know, embodied by the author here wow. with us today. And, and um, Thank you. well, not only that, um, you kick this book off with a quote from Henry James. I mean, not only are you a great cook, but I know that you're a total bookworm as well, which we all love. Um, yeah, I, love I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can you tell us about um, summer afternoon? Summer afternoon, you know, the two sweetest words ever, right? Yes. I mean, when you say summer afternoon, doesn't that just make you get that feeling of, like you close your eyes and I start to think like, what's my perfect summer afternoon? And like sitting under the shade of a tree and it's hot out and I have a straw hat on and I'm reading a book and trying to keep my eyes open and you just kind of let yourself fall into sleep or you're eating like a juicy ripe peach with the juice dripping down your arm or hanging out at the beach. Like summer afternoon just evokes a feeling. So yes. when I read that quote, I thought, yeah. i got to put this and in By the way, that's my fantasy when I'm at Vanity Fair closing a piece and looking <laughs> out the window and kind of wondering what Katie's doing <laughs> right, right now. Um, it, and the book really is such a lovely um, culinary love letter um, to summer. I mean, maybe, you know, just can you tell us a little bit about where, you know, how this, yeah. how this got rolling, um, where it came so from? I wrote two cookbooks in the past, and I did those back-to-back -back in 2008 and 2009. And I really felt like, okay, I've done this. Like, I, I don't really think I need to write another cookbook. I was kind of over it and not really into wanting to write another one. I wrote a novel, and I loved writing fiction and doing something different. And um, summer is my favorite time of year. I spend most of my time out on the east end of Long Island, out in the Hamptons. And I love cooking in the summer. And I just started thinking, like, well, if I was going to do another cookbook, it would be nice to do it about summer and summer food. And then I started thinking more and more about it. And I wrote up a little proposal about summer food and what summer means to me. And, um, and we're losing a light fixture. Um, <laughs> how's my light? Um, <laughs> so... Uh, I, I partnered up with Abrams, who published the book. When I went in for a meeting with them, my editor, Holly Dolce, she just, like, got it right away. And then I knew I wanted to do this book with, with somebody who was just as passionate about it as me. So we actually kind of did it backwards because it was August at that time. And Holly said, listen, we're not going to be able to... Um, get the right photos if we don't photograph this now, but you haven't written the book yet. So, so um, my photographer, Lucy Schaefer, she came out to the Hamptons, and we went to the beach. We took all of our shots before I'd written anything at that point. Um, I put a grill in the back of my truck, took it out, got some lamb chops, and we grilled then I went to the farm stand, and randomly that photo, she was like, oh, the light's good over here. Come stand over here and hold this basket of tomatoes. And we ended up, you know, making that the cover shot. And I went home and, and cooked for our crew. And those recipes then I had to go back and write to match the photos of what we had photographed. And then the rest of the photos we shot later in a studio but we wanted to be able to get that real, authentic, that Hampton summer light, the feeling of the farmer's market, 
when you go and the corn looks so amazing and the tomatoes look like that. I can't wait for tomatoes like that. Is there anything better than a summer tomato? Like when you get one in February on a sandwich and it's so sad and it's mushy and like this pale hue of not really red. And yeah, it's the, car so the cardboard sad. tomato Yeah, they're syndrome. flavorless. Yeah. And the East End has those fabulous <laughs> tomatoes that you actually Such write about. Such good tomatoes. Um, you know, yeah. kissed by the salt air and you've yes. got your your heirlooms, so you have this great green gazpacho recipe in yeah. there with those green ze zebra mm -hmm. tomatoes that I know you love. I mean, it's, it's I love really all fantastic. those different tomatoes. You know, I, I wonder sometimes because, you know, like San Marzano tomatoes, they say it's all about, you know, the soil there and being close to the sea. And I, I think there must be something similar to that on Long Island yeah. because we get those great sweet tomatoes. Yes. Now, you mentioned cooking for a crowd, and I know that you're a great entertainer, right? And there's a I lot. I love having people over. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of entertaining in this book. And when you do think of summer, you think about, you know, grilling in the backyard, Fourth of July blowouts, um, sundowners on the porch, right? All of this stuff. And, and also, Katie's renowned for the occasional um, Labor Day blowout. <laughs> uh, a keg party. You know, I felt very <laughs> privileged to attend with. Um, Beer pong, which, of course, is one of the official sports of Ice summer. Ice yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, the keg party was actually born out of going to too many uptight Hamptons parties. I went to this party. I, I won't say whose it was, but I went with a group of friends, and the theme was a black party. Everyone was supposed to wear black. And then we got there, and it was really taken quite literally. They had no lights on. And <laughs> it was so dark. And then someone... This is, it's so pretentious, like I can't even. It's the, a spotlight came on and someone rode out on a horse and then someone else got up and read poetry. And I was like, I really can't take this. This is like the most yeah. ridiculous thing. And then someone <laughs> fell because it was so dark. <laughs> into like a mud puddle. So I'm just like <laughs> scrolling through a list of suspects in my <laughs> head as you describe this party. Like, who could that be? Who could it be? So I went home and said, that's it. I've had it. No more of these Hamptons parties. I'm having a keg party. And I did. I, you know, just like college, I bought a bunch of kegs. I had made ribs. And, mm -hmm. you know, we had um, a DJ and beer pong, and everyone had a lot of fun. I put on the invitation, no chic clothing whatsoever. <laughs> no one was allowed to take pictures yeah. <laughs> so that everyone could really have fun and not have it on social media. Yeah. And, uh, it, was it was a great It was day. fantastic, yeah, yeah. like hot dogs. And mm -hmm. um, Katie, very impressive keg stand, <laughs> by the way. I have to say, you do your alma mater. I, Miami of Ohio, very I, proud I learned a in that, lot that in category. College, yes, you know? yes, it takes core yes. strength. <laughs> it, it does. I would not attempt it at my it's kind of like age. yoga on a keg. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so when you are cooking for a crowd, what are some of your favorite um, things to do, or you know, well, grills to use, or I, what I like to do um, for my menu? I love things that I can make in advance and put in the refrigerator. You know, I really want to have fun when I have a party. I do not want to be in the kitchen all night, um, so I want to be enjoying everyone. I usually cook everything in the morning, put it in the fridge. I like to do a grain-based salad, like some kind of quinoa salad or farro salad. I like to do a bean or lentil salad, so that if someone's vegetarian or vegan, that that can double as a, a main course for them. And then some kind of green or vegetable salad. Then I'll usually put some meat or seafood in a marinade, and when it's time for the dinner to be served, I throw that on the grill, I pull the other stuff out of the fridge, and then it's like everything's done. No one knows that I was in my sweatpants all morning making it, and instead I'm calm, cool, and collected, <laughs> and it's an easy dinner. So, and that's what summer's about. It's not about like getting out your fine china and silverware and setting a formal table. It's just about being relaxed and, and just enjoying yourself, you know, and it's, it's not fussy. Right, and it's great to be part of the party as well if you're the host or hostess. Yeah, and sometimes totally. we get backed up behind all the logistics of mm -hmm. entertaining and we're pulling stuff out of the oven or off the grill at the last minute. And this and it's is not entirely fun, sensible. Then. You know, it, it's not as much fun if you're stressed about everything, you know, timing and, you know, it's not Thanksgiving. Right. It's, it's just easy breezy. And I know that you are a fan and a proselytizer of the thing known as the caja china, which I've got to get one of these. Thing. Does anybody know what a caja china is? Okay, get ready for this. So good. 
the Kahachina should be j called the magic box. <laughs> like, right. It is so great, yeah. isn't it? So it is a box that um, I, I may not be getting all the details right, but I believe Cubans in Miami saw it, it being used in Chinatown, something like it, right. and then yeah. they kind of merged the ideas and made this box. And you can put a whole pig in it, which is typical um, in Miami. That's something they do. Um, Cubans a lot. They they make this um, marinade and and inject the the pig with it. You can put a turkey in it. You can put ribs in it. You can put a pork butt in it. You can really put anything in it. And then you put the top on it and you build the fire on top of the box. And then magically everything cooks perfectly inside. So in the book, I did a turkey recipe, because you don't really think of turkey for summer, but it feeds a crowd, and you just do it a little differently than you would for Thanksgiving. So I made the same type of marinade that they would make for the pig with pineapple, lime juice, orange juice, garlic, everything. Inject the turkey. I put that into the cajachina. An hour and a half later, this magic turkey comes out that's perfectly juicy and crisp skin on the outside. Like, if you're looking for, like, a Father's Day gift, this is, like, the perfect thing. Yeah, and they're I amazing. am not in, by any way affiliated with the Kaha yeah, I know. We're turning either. into a Kaha <laughs> infomercial right yes. now. And we'll also give you this set of <laughs> knives to go with it. But, um, yeah, they, I mean, okay, I know I'm a little obsessed with things, but, like, it looks like a plywood box with, with bicycle wheels on it. And unlike a lot of high-end grilling equipment, it's actually the price point. It's pretty mellow. I won't yeah. quote any price here, but... Um, and there is something appealing about it. you could just load this thing. I mean, you could put like six turkeys inside of it, and they come in yeah, different sizes. Yeah, and I guess. everybody is in awe of it too yeah, when you pull it out. Right, yeah. it's sort of the grill of the moment. Yeah, um, people are like, "What's that?" Right, and again, it gets back to what you're saying about the the kind of no fuss entertaining. I mean, here's something where you load the thing in, you marinate, you load it in, and then you go, you have fun, you join the party, totally. and wait for this amazing stuff to come out of this. Um, cool Magic implement. Um, I've also heard it referred to as the Cajun microwave, oh. which, I quite, which I quite like. I like uh, that. Um, now, you know, um, in the book, there's a lot, of course, a lot of the Hamptons, a lot of West Virginia, where you're from, from Milton, West Virginia, right? Um, maybe you could talk about that, you know, that, that, that axis, if you will, West Virginia and the yeah. east end of Long Island, two places that have really inspired so much of what you do. Um, in food. Um, yeah, you know, you don't think, I, I'm from this little tiny town, 2,200 people, and you don't really think of that um, small town West Virginia and the Hamptons of being similar. You know, a lot of people think of the Hamptons and think of this kind of glitzy, glamorous place, and like, there are those things that happen there, but then there's also, for me, it's all about the farms and the beaches, and we have amazing farms there. And the farm stand that I go to, it's actually been in the same family since the 1600s, which I think is so incredible. So um, I find a lot of similarities when it comes to food. You know, not the same, not the exact same cuisine, but the idea of eating what's raised there and local and seasonal and like this small town community feel. So I really identify with the area and that's really become home for me. And it inspires my cooking always. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I feel like I, I make whatever they have at the Green Thumb that day. Um, or I can go, you know, if I go right out of my driveway, I go to Green Thumb for produce. If I go left, I go to North Sea Farms to get chicken. Um, I can go down to Meacock's Bay Dairy and get my cheese. There's even sea salt farmers now. Amagansett Sea Salt's a great one. And I went to visit that guy when he first started, and he was actually just getting buckets of seawater, and he built all these salt beds to dehydrate it and then refine it and had a whole process. But it's really an inspiring place to be for anyone who loves food and loves to cook and loves to eat. And then how did that compare with West Virginia? Because I imagine that in an earlier time, and it's a rural place, there was a lot of that anyway, but there wasn't really that consciousness that we have now of like farm to table, like nobody, you know, needed yeah. to, like, to have a food blog to tell somebody there, <laughs> you know right, what I mean? That, right, um, and, and I, you know, it's like I hear farm to table, and it's like we've used that term so much that I'm almost sick of it, um, but that's how I grew up, and it wasn't because it was a thing, it was just that's what was economical, and that's what we did. So um, my grandpa had this great garden, 
He had a cousin that raised cows, another cousin that raised pigs. Everybody shared. My grandma had this big coffin freezer in the basement where they'd put all the meat. <laughs> and, um, and she was also really into canning and preserving what we had. Um, when it was green bean season, she actually put a stove on the back porch because she didn't want the house to get so hot. And we would all have to string green beans. And I remember I hated it when it was green bean time because I hated stringing those beans. And we'd do it for, it was like endless. It never ended. And then she would be canning the green beans until like 2 in the morning. And we'd have canned tomatoes. And she'd make peach preserves and apple butter. And I mean, everything, everybody just saved. And then we ate it all year long. She also made this stuff. Have you ever heard of chow chow? But yes, uh, no, I have. I grew up pretty close to the Amish in in yeah. Pennsylvania, and they do chow chow like yeah, nobody's chow -chow's business. So good, it's so isn't good. It? I've, I've got, yeah, I've got a jar of it actually in my fridge. We went away on some vacation at some point in the last like six or eight months. I came home. We totally emptied out the fridge. I came home. There was a jar of chow chow in there and like a jar of apple butter. And I took a picture of this just to document like this proves that I'm actually I'm from not Pennsylvania. I'm surprised at yeah, all from anyway. you. Yeah. So, <laughs> Mark and I bonded over a shared love of biscuits, actually. That's, that's how right, we became right. good friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, he had gone to West Virginia and tried Tudor's biscuits. I did. <laughs> so good. They're so good. Yeah, do they, they still exist, right? Yes, Tudors okay. still exist. We'll give them a shout out yes. today, hey, too. Yes, hey, Tudors. Biscuit yeah. World. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. And you grew up, um, you know, with a lot of biscuits probably in the house. Was this something mm -hmm. that was like a daily thing with cat head biscuits? or Biscuit you know? dough was my Play-Doh. Okay. You know, my grandma would pull a stool over to the counter, and I'd get up and help her make the biscuits when I was a little kid. And if I would show up after she had made the biscuits, there would be a little fit that was thrown. And she'd have to make another batch so that I could have my Play-Doh. Yeah. <laughs> that was like, you know, my bratty moment. Like, There's no more biscuit dough. Wow. So. And did I have to ask you, did you, you know, in your family, were they made with lard or some other shortening? The she biscuits usually or the used, different you know, she usually used curious. Crisco, which okay. is not, not the healthiest way to go. Right. Now she uses butter. Okay. You know, it, she made the change. Um, but the vegetable shortening really does give you a nice fluffy biscuit. Right. Now, I'm t you talked about a little bit of gardening, right? Do you garden yourself? I am a terrible gardener. Okay. Um, I joke that I have a black thumb instead of a green okay. thumb. You know, mine's like <laughs> the thumb of death for all, all plants. Uh, I've tried over and over. I'm just not right. good at it. So, and then I get anxiety, like, <laughs> oh my God, what am I going to do with all these tomatoes? And I'm giving them to everyone. And then the zucchini overnight turns into like this giant monster zucchini. And I, so now I just go to the farm stand. And I also realized I was spending more money on these plants that I was killing and then replanting than to just go right. buy the vegetables. And then you don't have to weed all day. It's like what you're talking about yeah. with stringing the green beans. It's like yeah. the dark side of stuff. Yeah, summer. I wanted to be the person who gardened. I yeah. wanted to be that person so badly. Yeah, yeah. And it just wasn't happening for we me. We had a huge so garden when I was a kid. My dad was really into it. We had a huge strawberry patch. And, of course, I love strawberries like all kids do. But those long afternoons out there having to weed the strawberry patch yeah. Not kind of reduces. <laughs> <laughs> your ardor <laughs> a little bit for the strawberry. But aren't the strawberries but that come out so good? They seriously are yeah. the best. You know, like when you get at the grocery store, the strawberries have that white hard center, and to get yeah. the fresh ones that are just red and juicy all the way through, mm. there's nothing like it. Yeah, and you can wait and wait until they're mm -hmm. until they're just perfect. I love those. Um, now, a, a big part of the book is what I think of as the holy trinity of summer comfort food. Of course, I'm talking about burgers, tacos, pizza. Maybe we could just like <laughs> click these off one after another. Uh, and just, again, some fabulous approaches like this burger, this ranch burger with, um, with bacon, the BLT, BLT ranch burger. Maybe we could talk, mm. uh, tell us about burgers, please. Well, I decided to make a chapter devoted to burgers, tacos, and pizza because I didn't really know where they fit in the book. You know, I, I broke the book up into morning fuel, light meals, cocktail hour, dinner, desserts. So I said, where do those go? Because they could go at lunchtime, they could go at dinner time. Let's just give them their own special moment because they really are the greatest. Yes. Um, so one of my favorite recipes is the BLT Ranch Burger. And I love ranch dressing. 
That was like growing up as a kid. I think that that's how my grandma got all the kids to eat vegetables. She'd give us a bowl of ranch and said, you can eat it with your fingers, then you can dip it in ranch. So <laughs> it was no problem then eating broccoli um, if it was covered in ranch dressing. So why not put it on a burger with bacon, lettuce, tomato? It's yummy. Fabulous. Mm -hmm. And there's shrimp burgers. Oh, yeah. Right, um, right. Turkey yes. burgers. What yeah. else is in there? Then the tacos, steak right. tacos, chicken oh, tacos. Oh, and we should know that you have, you know, burgers loom large in your, in your legend, of course, the Logan County burger, which everyone yes, loves. the Logan County burger, the controversial burger. Do you still make those? Or are you, oh, yeah, are you, okay. yeah. Okay. So um, back in 2008, the first New York City Wine and Food Festival burger bash um, I was in it, and I didn't even really realize it was a competition until I showed up, and it was all these fancy chefs who were making these big burgers. And I had my silly little Logan County burger. My grandma's Logan County, West Virginia. They didn't have a lot of money, so they made really thin burgers so they could stretch the meat and serve them on white bread with American cheese. And uh, you, t you toast it, so it's like a grilled cheese with a burger tucked inside. I somehow won, and people were mad. Other chefs, I was the only female, which made me even happier, you know, that a, a girl was winning the Burger Bash. But um, I do know of one who you would all know, and I, I won't say his name, asked for a recount. Um, and I would like to point out that he wasn't even in the top three. So <laughs> he shouldn't have been so worried about my burger. You can Google all of this, by the way, after you go home. I'm sure you can get all the names. <laughs> and it ended up being like this burger controversy. Like yeah. New York Magazine did a story if it was right. really a burger because it was on bread and not a bun. And yeah. I just cracked up. Uh, yeah, it was hilariously, wildly entertaining. A great moment. And I'm sure like the entire state of West Virginia was high-fiving while this was all happening. Um, <laughs> terrific. Um, now, and tacos. Tell us about tacos. Tacos. Yes, oh, tacos. I love tacos. I've always loved tacos, um, but when I was writing my novel, it, it, uh, the story takes place in Mexico. So I went to Mexico for a month, and I thought I was going to write this whole book in that month. Meanwhile, I did nothing. Um, I ate a lot of tacos, surfed, and drank tequila. Um, that's, <laughs> I was that's, like, it's research. That's something. Yeah. yeah, research. And I ended up meeting this woman. Her name was Rosa, and she had a little stand, and she cooked everything on hot plates, and her food was incredible. So I don't speak Spanish. I got somebody to ask her if I could um, come to work with her one day and, and you know, cook with her and she said yes I showed up like 10 minutes late and she scolded me in Spanish and, <laughs> and uh, I, I you know got a lot of ideas from her and, and technique and uh, she was great so I made um, there's four different taco recipes in the book uh, none of them are Rose's recipe but you know kind of inspired and I, I like to make fruit salsas too you know like using that salty sweet and you know, getting like, I think it's a, um, there's a, a cucumber and cantaloupe and peach and, you know, all that good jazz. And I like that spice with something yeah. sweet like that, you know, having it counterbalance. And I actually, I tested all my taco recipes on a group of friends and told them to pick their favorite. There's steak, chicken, tofu, and fish. And they were all like, tofu tacos? Why did you make us tofu tacos? And they won. The, that was everyone's right. favorite yeah. at the end. They're smoky tofu. Smoky tofu, yeah. Yeah, and they're awesome. It's such awesome. a curveball, but they do sound yeah, amazing. Yeah, they're really, really yeah. good. Yeah. yeah, so sometimes, you know, the vegetarian stuff wins. So the great thing about the taco is how versatile it is, and you can kind of mm -hmm. slap anything in there. Tacos are great for leftovers. Mm -hmm. You know, I, right. I do a, a segment on the kitchen called Leftover Lovin'. Right. And, you know, yeah. just give those leftovers a little bit of lovin' and turn them into something totally different, and then they don't feel like leftovers. Right. Now, pizza. You've been to pizza school, I know, which is a little intimidating, yes. but um, what did you learn there? And this is interesting because I have to say that I practically majored in pizza in college <laughs> myself. <laughs> oh, I'm not making it, but anyway, um, oh, tell I us love, a little about that. I love that. pizza. So I got a pizza oven and um, became kind of obsessed with pizza, and I found out that there was a pizza school. It's um, called uh, VPN. 
Vera Pizza Napolitana, and it's this group from Naples, and their objective is to defend the honor of true Neapolitan pizza, which I love that they say to defend yes. the honor. And they open campuses around the country. There's one in Naples, uh, Sao Paulo, there's one in Tokyo, and the one in the States is in Marina Del Rey. And I said, why did you guys open, you know, why not New York? Why Marina Del Rey? And they're like, oh, the weather is so nice here. <laughs> so, go figure. Um, but I went to pizza school. I learned so much there. They actually made us take um, a practical exam and a written exam at the end. And I was so nervous. I thought, what if I fail my pizza exam? Like, I know I, I got it down to make the pizza, but the written, I haven't taken Imagine an exam. Imagine the shame in, of that. In a decade. I know. I would have been, it would have been like I, I, when I failed my driver's test the first time, <laughs> which I did. Okay. Uh, All right. We were talking about road trips earlier and your mother not letting you drive. So yeah, no. maybe that's it. Okay. Sorry um, to overshare on your... So, yeah, that, anyway. That's okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I really got into the pizza. I love Neapolitan-style pizza. I love that there's a lot of rules to it. You know, I think that that's fun and kind of funny. Mm -hmm. And everything has to be very precise to the type of What are of some of the rules? So, well, it has to be double zero flour. Okay. They prefer to use bottled water from Italy. I think maybe that's a little over the top. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the oven has to be between 800 and 900 degrees. It needs to cook in 60 to 90 seconds. Um, when you put the sauce on, you should put one ladle and then do it in a clockwise motion. The, from the center and out? Uh, from the center and okay. out. The cheese should go on the mozzarella. Um, they said like little islands of mozzarella, not a whole bunch, you know, so there's just little islands of it in that sea of sauce. Um, two basil leaves, each torn in half. Okay. And the olive oil goes on at the end in a backward six. Backward six, okay. Yeah. Wow, okay. So, so lots of rules. Incredible <laughs> level of detail. And the other amazing thing about pizza is that you can do it on the grill, which I know is something that you like to do. Yeah, which is a I great love thing, a great suggestion for everybody. I think. Yeah, if if you have not grilled pizza, do it. It's not intimidating. I know it sounds like oh, grilled pizza that's hard. It is the easiest way you will ever cook pizza. It's so simple. Just have a clean grill, a clean grill, and it won't stick. It's great. Now, there's also, you know, one thing going back to what um, West Virginia and New York City and the East End, there's so many recipes here that sort of combine those things where you will take something kind of down home and give it some big city, you know, panache or vice versa. There's a panzanella salad that looks so appealing that has cornbread in it instead of the usual Tuscan bread. Yeah. Um, your pimento cheese has goat cheese in it, which looks fabulous to me. Um, I'm trying to think of other, oh, the lobster Reuben. Oh, those that are is yummy. insane. Yeah, yeah, those are yummy ones. Yeah. yeah. The cornbread panzanella, I love panzanella, and I thought, like, what can I do to make this have a little bit of a southern spin? And I always wind up with leftover cornbread whenever I make it. My grandma made homemade cornbread every night for dinner. We always had it fresh, wow. and it was so good. And so what to do with all that leftover? Like, cut it up and make croutons, and then throw it in a salad. It's yummy. That's fantastic. That's great. Um, are we ready for... Questions? We'd love to hear from you guys. Um, anyone wants to do the honors? Uh, you mentioned it earlier. What is chow chow? Oh, chow chow. So everybody's is a little bit different, but it's chopped up cabbage. Um, there's usually like a pimento in there or some kind of pepper. Some people's are a little spicy. Some are more sweet, and they pickle it. And it turns this like yellow color. I don't know if they put turmeric in it. It's or? yellow. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically what I know. Yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm, crunchy. I'm, um, I've never crunchy made it. Crunchy vegetable My mom makes it. relish. It is a little sweet and sour, the way many sort of PA Dutch things are. Yeah. I want to say vaguely related to piccalilli in a way. Maybe I'm wrong. To what? Somebody will correct me. You know, like the English relish piccalilli, which is yellow and oh, has. Oh, okay. Maybe that's where it's. Stuff in derived there. Derived from. Hmm. Yeah. It's really good. Like, if you see chow chow, get it. You can, like, put it on a sandwich. You can eat it on the side. Right. It's a great it's secret good. weapon because it's so, it's so zesty, mm -hmm. and there's something really refreshing about it. It's part of the tradition that they have there called plain and fancy, where they'll put tons of little <laughs> relishes and things on the table. I like so that. Plain and plain fancy. Plain and fancy. That's how we do it. Plain we don't talk fancy. that way, but, you know. <laughs> um, I won't. I won't. 
don't imp impersonate an Amish person. Um, any, anybody else? Uh, what's like your favorite ch uh, childhood memory of cooking? Oh, my favorite childhood memory of cooking. Hmm. I feel like there's a lot. Um, really more than anything, it was our breakfast table. You know, we always had this big breakfast. I lived in the same neighborhood as my grandparents, my great aunt and uncle, um, and my great grandmother. And so my grandma would make these big weekend breakfasts. Everybody would come over. My mom's brothers would come over with their kids, so my cousins were there. And, like, everybody just kind of lingered all morning and talked and, like, had that, like, coffee talk. And, you know, and I still love that. I love, like, whenever I have house guests to do coffee talk in the morning. That's the best time of day on a weekend. You know, kind of, like, catch up on what all happened, talk about everybody from the night before, <laughs> play like winners and losers who are the winners totally, and losers great. of the night <laughs> and it's great watching people just kind of drift into the kitchen kind yeah. of dragging themselves in the <laughs> totally the next, the next totally day. i have this friend um her name's marcy bloom and she is my favorite house guest because of her coffee talk right. and it, the routine is the same every time she comes downstairs from the you know bed and she's like got her hair all messed up and mascara all over her face and she's like what are you people so happy about down here <laughs> and then she launches into her yeah. spiel yeah. yeah and I know there's um when you were a kid in West Virginia um you made like a home video of yourself cooking or something when you were yeah, pretty young I did when I was okay. like 12 wow, okay. there was a blizzard and I decided to have my grandparents over for um a fancy dinner party. <laughs> and I walked to the store in the blizzard and got everything and I made yeah. beef stroganoff and I made my mom videotape me doing a cooking show oh my God. Wow. <laughs> and how to set the table. It's fantastic. It was pretty funny yeah. and I think she lost the video. Respect. Um, so I, I recently graduated from college so I was wondering kind of what your go-to recipes were when you were like just out of college and starting off with cooking on your own that kind of thing. I made stir fry a lot when I was in college and, and just starting out. Um, I just saw my college roommate the other day and we were talking about all of our stir fries and we were really into those little seasoning packets for the stir fry and cutting up all of our vegetables and we would do either shrimp or tofu. And um, she told me that she has tried to recreate our tofu stir fry and her husband calls it the tofu blizzard like because it, it's never worked ever again. Uh, so I don't know what we were doing to it back then that made it great. Um, but that was something I made a lot. Uh, chicken paillard I, I made quite a bit. Um, great summer dish, too. Yeah, great summer dish. Uh, there's a, a grown-up version of it <laughs> in this book. Um, but, yeah, stir-fry was my big go-to. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Anyone? One more. Anyone, anyone? Okay. Oh, wait, we have one. Yes, Yay. Hi there. Hello. Um, you said that you, uh, you wrote fiction, mm -hmm. uh, a fiction novel. Have you uh -huh. ever thought about writing a fiction novel with recipes in it, like they're at a dinner party? I have thought about that, and I tried. I tried many times before I wrote the novel that I ended up writing, and all of them sucked. Um, <laughs> And <laughs> that's why I didn't write any of them. I kept thinking that I wanted to write fiction, but it needed to have a food angle. So I'd write about a girl in a bakery or a chef or something. And I couldn't get a story. And so the book I ended up writing, Groundswell, was about um, surfing and kind of finding yourself. And um, that story hit me and stuck. And I said, well, I guess I don't have to write about food. But I would love to write that book. That's like what I'm looking for that story. I'm just waiting for it to hit me over the head, and it hasn't yet. And Katie, just maybe one last question. I would just like to, do you have another, are you working on an, another book? Are you thinking about what's going to happen next? Can you preview anything for us? I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm working on, like, enjoying summer. And I've also, I, you know, I've never been the type of person who, really sets many goals. I, I know that that sounds backwards, but um, I don't ever think, like, where would, am I going to be in five years, ten years, or I don't think, like, what's my next project going to be? Like, I've kind of just let things happen, and I feel like if you let life lead you where you're going, like, there'll be a natural progression and figure it out. 
because I never would have said I would have been here if you'd asked me 10 years ago. Great. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. It was fun. Thank you, Mark. It was the best. Thank you.